hey everyone and welcome back to another youtube video so in the past two streams if you have been following along with them you've seen that i was making a ball bouncing uh, projectile motion simulator using python so in the last stream the result that we obtained was basically we had a ball and it followed a projectile motion and we could predict uh, the position that the ball would be like basically the maximum height and the maximum displacement that the ball would reach and some of those characteristics by ourselves using like uh, the equations that we had derived in the first stream so i guess that was like the final result that we obtained and at the end of the stream i did kind of highlight that i wanted to add a couple of more features to this mainly i kind of wanted to add uh uh, a feature wherein the ball could rebound and you know it would be a bit more realistic uh because in i mean obviously in real life you see that balls do rebound and that obviously the rebound height shouldn't be the same as the actual height because well there's always going to be some energy wasted in overcoming air resistance and stuff like that so uh i kind of wanted to do that because i thought that it would be kind of a cool little thing and plus it would add a lot more realism to the project that we are building and this kind of makes it look a bit more like angry birds because if you do if you know i'm pretty sure all of you have some some point in your life has play, have played angry birds but you know that kind of makes it look a bit like that so that's kind of what i wanted to do because it's really cool and you know i just wanted to do that so i did do that so first I'm going to show you what I actually got as a result and then I'm going to walk you through how you, you know you can do the same. What I'm going to also do is I'm going to link uh, below the GitHub repository for this uh, so you can download all of this code and uh, the map that we had worked out in the first video. So I'm going to link it down below uh, for your reference you know just so you can check it out. Alright so uh, let me just go ahead and run the main.py file and I'll show you what we have. First thing I did was I actually changed the screen dimensions and I actually made it 1000 by 600. Mainly because the 800 screen with rebounces was a very very small screen to be working with. Because if you throw a ball at 45 degrees it already travels a very long distance. And in that case if it rebounds again even though you know we reduce... We add some kind of an inefficiency or maybe we did like basically i'm dissipating energy uh it still does travel a very long distance because it usually rebounds at it, it rebounds thrice and so if it if your ball rebounds thrice you can kind of imagine why uh it would just go out of screen so in that case i basically increased the pick uh the width of the screen so uh, the ball could be accommodated a bit more nicely so all right so now let's actually first let's just throw the ball up vertically also another feature that i added which was really cool is i added vectors for the horizontal and vertical velocity of the ball at a particular point i'll show you what that is how it looks like you can see that uh you have this dynamically kind of scaling uh, vector representing that and you can see that there's this bouncing and now we'll launch it at an angle so like this see it kind of bounces and it's going down 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 and there we go so this is kind of what i built obviously as you know i did this off camera uh that's because i did not know firstly if i would be able to make this secondly because what i did on the live stream i was reasonably come uh sure that i would be able to make something like that because you know i mean i have been programming for a while now and i kind of had trust that i would be able to do something like that however for this one i was a bit unsure since uh i mean i hadn't actually done any physics simulations before so i was a bit unsure but whatever needless to say we didn't manage to figure that out uh actually this is just uh useless i don't need this i was trying something out but i did it in a much more efficient way i guess all right so i'll show you what that is, uh what i did so whatever we figured out in the previous video was all of this stuff uh i don't need to kind of walk you through that so i'll first walk you through this so basically uh representing those two vectors the for the x and y so the x pause vector uh basically x position vector actually it should more be like x well vector because it's more like the velocity that we are representing so i'll just call it x well vec and y well vec we basically are just drawing a line 
obviously and it's red in color and obviously the initial positions are going to be ball x and ball y but for the y uh, but for the uh, uh what do you say the final positions basically what i'm doing is i'm just saying ball x plus ball x change times 10 comma ball y and obviously the width is 4 ball y because i mean obviously the x vector shouldn't be uh slanting along the y dimension so yeah that's pretty much the reason for that and yeah that's pretty much all that there is to it all right for the y velvet it's also pretty much the same i mean it's ball x ball y however for here i'm just doing ball y change times 10 if you want a quick reminder as to why I'm doing the times 10, it's because over here you can see that when I get the well x and well y, the way I get the ball x change and ball y change is by dividing the two, two velocities by 10. So that's why I'm pretty much then multiplying them by 10 in order to get the well x and well y, which in reality were the actual lengths of the vectors that was being drawn by the line. So that's kind of why I did that. So that's that. The next thing we want to look into is the rebounding logic. So rebounding logic is also pretty simple. It's just, it was just slightly tedious to actually think of how I could approach it. I tried maybe two or three methods, but I then kind of eventually settled on this. I don't know if it's the most optimal method, but I guess it works the best. I mean, I, because uh, I mean, I tried it out and for the particular situation that I've modeled where the ball has a cap on the maximum velocity set by me, this condition works well. If you change the cap, then you might have to change the condition. For now, I'm not gonna do any of that stuff. Uh, I use a like basic math in order to figure that out. It's, it's not that difficult, but I'll walk you through that. So basically, uh, what I've done is I'm just checking the boundary condition just like this but I'm making one small tweak which is that over here I'm saying that the ball shouldn't be moving here I'm just saying that the ball should be moving now if the ball is moving that means the ball should be rebounded because the ball is moving so it's probably going from up to down so in this case I first check how many bounces have been done if there are less than three bounces then what I want to do is I want to take the ball y change and then I want to multiply it by negative 0.07 now, uh, the reason I'm not actually changing the ball x change. Actually, when I really think about it, I should actually also be changing the ball x change because it makes the most sense. So, let's actually do that. Because, I'm not sure if you know this, but uh, there is friction even along like the actual x component when there is a rebound. So we can also then just go ahead and multiply ball exchange by 0.7. Now, then if there are more than three bounces, then I just immediately set ball y change ball exchange to zero, ball y to this, blah, blah, blah. But why do I do that? I'm guessing a lot of you probably figured it out. But the problem is right over here. I'm multiplying by a constant. Now, let me show you something that I think you should kind of be looking at. What I want to know is a graph. What should ball y changes graph look like? Because let, let's try to represent the equation for ball y change with a certain graph. So I'm going to go ahead and open up test box. So I always like that whenever I'm trying to do these kinds of simulations, you should be smart enough to actually spot these bugs. Because believe me, it just saves time and again as i highlighted in one of my previous videos it kind of separates a good programmer from a great programmer so we have a ball y change that i'm multiplying by a point seven negative points and for now i'm just gonna set it to point seven doesn't really matter we are gonna have an initial ball y change which is a, a minus a two so if i say two times i'm multiplying it by point seven and i'm doing that for like n number of times right so we can raise that to x all right and that's obviously going to be equal to your y so let's take a look at this function all right let's take a look at this graph because i think most of you will immediately spot the problem uh i'm going to reverse the contrast so it's a bit more easier on the eyes uh all right so i'm pretty sure most of you immediately spot the error that we are having over here 
so we obviously just want to limit the graphs domain to zero to infinity we don't really care about negative for now it is that the graph is asymptotic at y equals zero what does the term asymptotic mean am i just throwing random words at you well asymptotic means the graph the graph is uh the tangent to infinity or okay now wait let's 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 use some some okay so basically uh the graph meets y equals zero or let's say like the x-axis at infinity meaning the graph your y change can never reach zero there will always be a y change now the thing is you shouldn't really care about a y change of like 10 raised to minus 100 right because it doesn't make any sense but the thing is, our computers, well, they are designed to look at even the smallest of the numbers and they still won't round it down. So in such a case, if you look at such a large number, I'm sorry, such a small number, the computer will still consider the ball to be moving, which isn't really representative of real life at all. So that's why I'm limiting the number of bounces to three. But why three? Now, it's a simple thing. Basically, if you look at these bounces, the heights reached by the bounces follow a geometric progression with a common ratio of 0.7. I'm multiplying everything by 0.7. I know that there is an initial term. I can set a final term in my head. And then I can just figure out at what number that final term could be reached at. That's a very simple thing that I just did. And I found that it was around three to four bounces. To be a bit more conservative, I went with three. You can maybe increase that. You can perform the computation however you want and you can get an answer. I landed up with three. You can kind of do whatever you want. Uh, but I would not recommend going over five. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the rebounding. Other than that, I don't think I really made any changes. I think everything else is just pretty much the same. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, as you can see, it's the code is pretty much just the same. And you can see how, you know, we have a much cooler result now. It's a lot more physics-like. I'll just change the title. It's Idealistic Case Projectile Motion Simulator. It's because, I mean, we are looking at a pretty idealistic case. We also made one tiny change, which is we also scaled the X change. So let's take a look at this new result that we have. Uh, all right, so let's do that. We have a bit of an X velocity over here. So you can see that the X component is also scaled down. And now you can see that this is a lot more, I would say, realistic than what you would probably have seen. All right, so now we can do it at a bit of a larger velocity. So we're going to boom, boom 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 wow that's so cool so you can see this is what we have and it's it's pretty cool i really like it and i mean this wasn't really supposed to be a very long video this was more of just to kind of give you a decent idea of what it is that i made because i did kind of say on the live stream that i would do something off camera so i hope you understood what it is that i've done over here besides that i don't think anything else has changed Maybe in the GitHub repository, you'll find one last change, which is that I'll have like a Pygame font wherein I'll be printing out like the uh, height and the uh, theta and the distance that it'll go to. But that's kind of iffy. I don't know if I'll do that. I don't really care about aesthetics in this case. So I, I don't know if I'll do that. I'll leave that as an exercise to you guys. You know, try doing that on your own. It's actually... A I mean, you literally just need to do one little Google search in order to figure that out. So, yeah, go ahead, check that out, and let me know in the comment section if you do it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video series. Uh, it's pretty cool if you ask me, you know, seeing physics as a simulation. Because, you know, I don't really like doing physics experiments at school. So, yeah, for me, this is pretty cool. Alright, so that's it for this video.